the instruction and use the uh, mic in order you not to suffer from the Larsen effect. Well, good day, welcome, and uh, you're very courageous as you have joined during lunch time for this uh, roundtable about telemedicine and we were wondering about what security for this new use. Dorian Marcelin, a journalist for Alliance I do follow and do monitor the organization of this in a digital world. And so we are very concerned by this. And we have got the opportunity to listen to feedback of their experience. And discuss this subject with a variety of um, professions and people. I'll start on my left, Eric Boucher de Crèvecoeur, engineer in uh, health and uh, working for the CNIL in France, the institution in charge of um, respect of privacy. And Mr. Charvan, SSI of uh, a hospital in Brest, Christophe Delpierre on my right hand side, risk and take, a editor of a risk management tool. Risk management tool and he has got labeled as a risk manager and you have also been uh, RSSI in health sector and you were one of the contributors of the very first digitalization steps that occurred a time ago. Eric Voisin, RSSI of another hospital, and this year and for some month, many people do know that this doctor. You have been contributing on the uh, vaccination program in France, isn't it? As such, this uh, subject is quite a global subject, as you could see that in the title. What use? What security? And really considering the new use, uh, new call of on, on health, e-health. E-health, as we know in recent years, uh, there has been a major evolution. My Health to 2022 has boosted the development of uh, telemedicine in 2018. Look at the figures, quite some consultations that increased majorly and specifically in recent times because of the pandemic. Some figures show that uh, three physicians out of four do suggest and uh, propose that kind of uh, consultation. 40,000 uh, visits in 2020 before the COVID and it has uh, increased to 150,000 a week in September the same year. So this is a very uh, impressive increase. That's about um, the context and as I think you are informed about this because this has been set on television and media and also the uh, health institutions have been uh, producing, providing some figures. The Hospital of Dax also Dordogne and Villefranche and also the hospital in Arles in August that has been attacked, a digital attack and uh, some ransomware was used. Ransomware which caused quite some issues for these hospitals but if you refer to the uh, minister, the, to the secretary, state secretary of the digital dimension well, that kind of attacks have doubled in this sector in 2020. Doubled. First question, to listen to that context. What is threatening the e-health? What is a threat? What's a health, uh, a threat to telemedicine? Is there any specific case you can talk about? And of course, there has been a switch a year ago 
I used to uh, attend a press conference with uh, the manager of the hospital of Nancy, and they said he said that the hospitals didn't believe in this uh, threat, and they would prefer to use the money for other things. And 2020 has been a shock in that sector. So regarding that uh, assessment of the threat, what's according to you the background? of this, why do uh, potential uh, hackers do that? And what is the kind of issue we have to face into the cyber security? A uh, representative of the hospital and uh, breast. Well, perception is rather clear today. Let's say we wonder whether it is a uh, targeted attack of a group of hackers regarding health institutions. I would say it's rather opportunistic because of the uh, exposition and the, uh, it is exposed. We are asked to be connected to more and more players on the territory in France. As such, you need internet or other alternative systems, so we are more exposed. And as such, hackers have got more servers to attack. And as such, we have to face, from time to time, attacks or uh, disruption into a uh, service because of hackers that didn't know that they were into a IP address. Or sometimes it is the company, sometimes it's another parameter of the health sector. So it's rather opportunistic. There's no targeted attack to hospitals specifically. But what I do notice is that the data, health data, there is much more care for that on behalf of uh, hackers because this can be sold on the black market and it's more expensive than classical traditional uh, privacy data. So that can raise our concern, a major concern. Thank you. Just to understand, no targeted attack. So there's only interest for getting, catching a communication or a teleconsultation or in very specific cases. But there's no uh, ransomware or not, no money to be made out of that. Yes, indeed, not necessary a lot of money. But you might have a targeted attack, for instance, a coordination between different attacks on the e, uh, on the sector, on the health sector, and that might you might they might get deep into. You might think the uh, health, the French health, might be targeted. Today we have to face sporadic cases, but uh, in terms of frequency, I'm not sure health is more affected than any other sector. It is always sensitive, and as such, there's much more talk about that. Eric, can you talk about what has been said by Jean Sylvain regarding the care that is brought to the uh, health data? Health data, you noticed a, a increase and an evolution in recent times. Well, yes, indeed, the uh, data violation, this infringement, has to be communicated to the CNIL when it might lead to some risks for those people. Uh, regarding this, there has been twice more attacks in the uh, health sector two causes, and the first, it is the increase of attacks with uh, ransomware, but also people getting aware within the hospitals and uh, to signal and to alert the CNIL. So there is something positive regarding maturity, but it's negative because there are more attacks. Those attacks that are signaled, they are rather standard. It is a very uh, useful attachment or a system which is badly protected because of a password. So there is no elaborated attack, as you can see that in films, attacking a health institute or a hospital. This is quite simple. What we did notice in the press is that the uh, hacker attacking a health institute will increase the ransom. The ransom. That's what we noticed in the U.S. 
health institutes who paid a lot of money and that's an opportunity to say don't ever pay this ransom because you're going to increase the means of the attack of the hackers even if you pay this ransom you might not get back all your data and specifically don't do the same if you didn't close all the doors security wise of course so there are quite some uh, advice pieces of advice you might uh, uh, faint uh, negotiation but you don't get until payment yes just to uh, add to pick up the us but insurance paid this ransom and as such the uh, hackers became opportunistic they continued in that sector so that they had insurers to pay this is not the case in france and that's also part of that hypothesis of the opportunistic way to act but it's not for the sector not good for the sector as such cedric just one thing the opening of uh, IT systems with uh, Dr. Leap. We have also to deal with a ecosystem which has which has changed in the health, isn't it? How do you tackle that issue of a threat and that relationship to IT systems of uh, hospitals? Well, to us, that uh, threat is uh, quite uh, different as the one of Sylvain. We bring a solution to improve comfort of practitioners on a day-by-day -day basis. We are lucky because our ecosystem is very different as from a uh, hospital. We don't have that legacy. So our approach is more safe by default. This is not the case of other hospitals. So we are trying to uh, provide to all e-professionals, e-health professionals, a most secure solution. We are working with the CNIL on uh, many uh, subjects, and that's very clearly the case in the vaccination campaign. But there is uh, some digital consumerism in health sector, which was not the case before. This has been reinforced and strengthened because of the pandemic. A few figures in 2019, we were at the very start of teleconsultation. There has been a fire stake, feasty, uh, ceasefire. So a new approach in the uh, health sector that was not known before. And today we are world leader of teleconsultation. We do consume most of uh, teleconsultations of practitioners, of GPs, and the uh, cabinet have not been able to adapt to that new technologic uh, uh, change. The attacks do not change a lot in nature, but it's so easy as what we call in uh, mass and targeted attacks. So a very kind type of attack which is uh, working. You do notice that the IT system of CHU, the hospitals are more and more open with protection which is not uh, uh, proof, proven. And so to uh, get money for this uh, data health, uh, data you get money for that for $25 you can play uh, with another attack well I will sell some um, blackmailing or whatsoever that is what's happening and this because of the digitalization of the ecosystem Christoph as regards what you did experience when you were S RSSI and today the uh, customers your clients well, the difference is that uh, uh, we used to say the uh, IT system might um, get uh, blocked and we will heal the patients. It's not the case anymore today. Life of patients is at stake when the IT system doesn't work. And that's also what you can experience when a prescription is not available. How to, uh, to take care of that patient and so it is not known what dose is it to be given to the patient. You will experience this if there is a loss of integrity or um, wrong knowledge of the, uh, um, of the nurses regarding the use of a tool to have a transfusion with an error of doses. Again, life of patients are at stake. 
IT is more and more used in the hospitals, more and more. It's there to help the patient, but one has to ensure that uh, IT system first confidentiality, secrecy of the data of the patients, and as you heard, there might be attacks of mafia, and thereafter this data is being sold on the dark web, and as such you can get the identity to uh, uh, attack someone with phishing, saying you did forget to uh, change your bank account, or to get uh, data to facilitate a new attack on behalf of a pirate, uh, a hacker, gets back to the threat. There might be states, um, of course, uh, threatening the French state in case of a war fire, a war. And if you have another kind of uh, threat, mafia, there is a financial interest, of course. It's easier today to sell and to uh, value the data into your data bank, e or rather than going to a bank, because there are mo no more cash. In bitcoins, you get money back. And also an internal threat, and that is a employee to, re to, 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 to will break a system. We have got all committed a error. Oh, I cancelled a file. The data is lost. Or you get a data and to take it on a uh, USB stick, USB stick which has been lost. So that threat does exist. And to uh, uh, oppose this threat with your system, it is important to look at the risk of our IT systems, to tool that approach, to have tooling and to notice, to identify the tools of our subcontractors. Is it efficient if we say that our uh, messaging system will be managed? You've got, uh, had, uh, got a message, mail exchange was not secure. So you have to ensure to the way to work with uh, subcontractors and their level of safe security. Yes, indeed, with uh, the uh, digital dimension, it is more and more important to uh, strengthen security. You were talking about the identity that is stolen, how far this uh, is a issue in such a uh, context of telemedicine. Is it something you have to face? Well, I was talking about telemedicine within the, the hospital and the health professional were talking about the identity of patients and it's so important we don't, uh, didn't know the misuse of identity and this specifically if you are providing health, care health uh, to that person, to, to that person. In Brittany, there is a lot and that might cause some issue. And there is a specific uh, care mm -hmm. shed on this. With telemedicine, you've got no uh, access to that patient. How to know it is the right person to ask for identity data? It's not that easy, as a matter of fact. Hence, that specific uh, attention which is uh, brought on that, and that is to be discussed with the uh, solution providers, but also with others, how to solve this issue, that need of safety, of security, to, to, to be trusted into the link between the care provider and the patient. So that's this idea of um, trust. You've got tools in telemedicines, e-health tools, but if people do not trust those tools and we get, listen to the, to the field and is this uh, uh, for sure in the telemedicine, the results I will send are the right results uh, reaching the um, health uh, professional. We need to be aware of that and that's very important. And therefore, we must have uh, must be very demanding regarding to the uh, people acting. Yes, it's about to uh, have that authentication, 
a reliable authentication, whether it be uh, care providers or patients, a remote system, it is so important. This has been monitored by the uh, ministry, but also by the CNIL with that CPS uh, card as a professional of e-health, but not that useful if you are in a uh, operation. So there has a evolution to the eCPS, which is a mobile app, but will also uh, follow the e-card Vital. It is a card that might be used as a authentication means of the patient and to get access to the DNP, to the file. As such, there are some uh, solution providers, but on, the, on the, the, the side of the CNIL, those tools will be validated at the national level in order to allow a reliable authentication of all players and in this electronic chain. Thank you for this and regarding identity and misused identity. As I said in this introduction, the culture of security in that e health sector as compared to the other activities and to pick up on what Guillaume said yesterday, the fact that at the moment you convince the players of a OSE, Essential Services Provider, in the framework of Artemis, it was promising a progressive um, uh, follow-up, and that was a error, a mistake. He would have preferred to meet with a hundred hospitals in the same room and to be briefed all together with uh, witnesses it is about emergency medicine, so whatsoever if everybody doesn't understand, but you have to pull forward and to push forward the limit. After this kind of witnesses, you are aware that there's quite some work to do regarding culture, the safety of the problem and so forth. We have to deal with uh, some people who are interested in that, people, in that uh, subject. What's your perception on the level of maturity of the players, whether it be employees or even management of a hospital, of a teaching hospital? I'd like to start with those uh, getting with your customers and your partners on regarding this subject. Cédric. Well, maybe I'm going to be a little bit pessimistic. Um, the culture of security in the, health, in, the, in the sector of health is near zero. It was never a big preoccupation for physicians. Their main preoccupation is to help their patients, to cure them ideally, and to guarantee that they're able to provide a medical response to a problem. What we notice at the moment is that the, the level varies. As you were saying, Dorian, it's 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 quite late in the game to become aware of security issues and there is a comparison like that i like to make currently industries where you have a strong security um culture is the banking industry but if you look if you lose your credit card number the bank will cancel it and it's got not going to be a big problem if you lose your medical history no one can just cancel it for you and give you a new one. So the, the, there, is a, there is an issue there and I think a lot of physicians, a lot of hospital managers, a lot of even solution providers are not really aware of the intensity of the problem, of the scope of the problem. Again, I'm being very pessimistic, quite dark here, but you have to be aware of the risks that the healthcare ecosystem is faced with and you know that a lot of um, a lot of um, um, safety operators in hospitals, they don't really have the right resources, they don't really have the right maturity level also at management level, and they will tend to go for um, access to care rather than safety, data security, um, and, and I think those are trade-offs that are not really acceptable at the moment. And it's what we were saying before, isn't it? Um, ecosystems have evolved so much and we started 
I mean, from scratch, we're we're pretty much 20 years late in terms of the tools that are available, in terms of the IS of hospitals. We have old systems that are very hard to, um, to, to securize, and it's a lot of effort that you need to invest in that. And a lot of people say, okay, we'll leave that system available so that we can continue to practice healthcare. It's, it's of course, it's good to be able to work, but it leads to risks that people are trying or are starting to get a glimpse of. I I know we started from scratch. We kept these very strong ethics from the get-go, from the starting with the creation of our software. We believe we have a very good level of security. We remain humble and we have to make a lot of effort. Um, but I believe that means need to be invested in, you know, the healthcare ecosystem. We were talking about it right before you arrived, but in 2023, we forced, um, we are going to force IS to use double factor authentication. 2026, we'll start using third party identities like France Connect. When you have a look at the dates versus the state of the threat, we are entirely disconnected from reality. We do not know what's at stake in terms of data management in IT environment. You're going to have a shared medical file in the future. And yet we are not, we are not from a security perspective, we are not where we need to be. It's, um, there's a lot to be done in healthcare, in e-health specifically, but I remain quite pessimistic in terms of the awareness um, of people regarding um, security. I'm going to try and, and lighten the mood a little because this is a, this is indeed quite quite scary what you're saying and uh, uh, maybe just let's check our computers and just use paper and pen right but no there is quite a quite a quite a large disparity between different hospitals that we have met with some of them are quite mature up to spec you know they have had a look at um, the GDPR and so on and so forth but others start from scratch and have no clue what an IS is they have um, they, they are in a much more difficult and dire even situation. So we have to start uh, cyber security solutions that are adapted to your maturity level. We need to have a pragmatic approach. Cedric, you're right. Our information system at the hospital sometimes is old. There is um, obsolescence. There is some editors. There are some editors that don't play along. I used to have all passwords for all um, all hospital um, systems in France for, for, for the um, for the OR and for the ER. So um, that is, of course, a problem. The ANSI um, is offering a cyber solution. We have 27 points plus minus that are going to make it possible for you to do a self-assessment and also to communicate with the management to tell them, look, here is where we are at at the moment. Here is the action plan that we're offering for next year. You can invest on this or that part. You can raise awareness. You can do audits. You can deal with risk management in order to make progress little by little. What, I mean, for those of you who are CISOs, um, you, need a, you need to give KPIs to your management, they don't know what a double factor is. They have no idea, like a double factor, what, what, what is that even about? They, they don't care and they don't know and they don't care that they don't know. What, what's important is to make them aware of the risk. What's the risk of hacking? What's the risk of data dis destruction? They don't care how hackers do it. They know they do it and that's enough. So as a CISO, you need to explain what the exposure is to the risk and you need to offer action plans. You're going to ask for support. You're going to ask the management for support. CISOs are here to help the managers. We're here, we're a service department. So we need to give others the mean to improve our position to deal with risks. You need to speak with the DSI, with the stakeholders with the different actors in order to make progress in terms of security measures to protect the patient's file and the um, hospital IS. You need to have a pragmatic and efficient approach and if you do do that step by step you'll see that security is actually kind of fun and, and you'll see that security is there, I mean the, the security department is here to support you in your daily work. Yeah, I was going to ask about, you know, the relationship with the management and uh, and I, I actually don't really agree. I think we, we tend to forget one thing, one fundamental thing. A hospital has two heads. There is the management, the administrative aspects, and there is the healthcare practitioners. 
the healthcare personnel. And those are the people that use the information system on a daily basis and they are going to complain because it doesn't work, they are going to complain because the password's complicated, they are going to complain because um, because they have problems determining the dose for the insulin pumps and so on and so forth. So there is, to an extent, I think we made a mistake in focusing too much on the administrative head, on the administrative hat. I think we need to, um, of course we said we need to work with them to set up security measures, but it's not the only way, it's not the only pathway, the only gateway. When I started working, one of the things I wanted to do first was to go to different departments to check how the health system was used. And I don't come from a health system, from a health service, so I went and had a look. Um, personally, I went to the ICU, for example. If you go to the ICU, you need to have um, the physicians enter their password for every gesture they want to do. It's about traceability. So they have 20 characters that they have to enter each and every time that they need to do something to or with a patient. You can imagine that, of course, if you have I mean, it's much simpler if they can have shorter passwords that are easier to use. So what do we need to do? We need to go uh, and see the healthcare professionals, the HCPs, and then try to guarantee the right level of safety. So we need to have multi-factor maybe, but maybe rather with like a stick that could be their, um, their CPS um, card in some facilities plus a code so that we have the right level of safety and security while not making it more complicated than for, to provide care to patients on a daily basis. And those are things that, I mean, I had forgotten a little bit. So I went on the field, I had a look at what was happening. And when I have a look at some guidelines or regulations, I'm like, this is not pragmatic. This is not practical. So we need to take that into consideration and adapt. And I think from an administrative perspective, it's good to work on that. But when you go to hospital, it's about healthcare. It's about what you, what happens on a daily basis. And you need to talk to the people who use the systems to determine what is or isn't acceptable. Why do they send pictures via email without protection? without encryption because they don't know the tools. So we there's a problem with us in terms of teaching them about the tools. We need to explain, of course, that there is a risk, but also that we have solutions and we do have solutions. They're not always complicated or expensive. So I think we need to make a lot of efforts in, in order to improve security and also to raise awareness with um, healthcare professionals working in hospitals on a daily basis. Thank you. Do physicians, do you think, um, and especially, you know, those who are in direct contact with, with patients, do you think, I mean, I think it's true for, for a lot of experts, actually, you have a lot of different types of experts in a lot of different sectors, and those are people who are very much about saying, look, security is not my job, even as a user, it's, um, I'm a specialist of something else. So do you think it's a specific type of audience? Do you think there is maybe a level of difficulty there? Well, that's a bit of a trick question, isn't it? Um, it depends on generations. It depends on generations, for sure. Um, you know, younger physicians starting to work in hospitals, they're more aware of the of the information systems. So they're more aware of, you know, data leaks. When we speak to them of data leaks, it, it rings a bell. They know what we're talking about. Others, uh, older physicians, maybe it's a bit more complicated. You need to show them, explain. Um, younger physicians, however, they are starting to understand that, yes, changing your behavior is important. And also they're aware that they can't do it. So that's another important dimension. And then also depends on their um, area of interests. Um, in some, let's say, endocrinology, for example, they have a lot of connected devices. So they're very much aware of the digital world and they have to be aware of it because the pumps are connected. So they will be interested in the risks. So there are some sectors that are becoming heavily digitalized and those sectors are more interested in security because this is part of their daily lives, even though before it was seen more as a constraint and now it's seen as, as maybe a plus. So it's not 100% either, but it, it, it is changing, I think. Yeah, and I believe, you know, for the safety culture, the security culture, um, 
you need to have a lot of, uh, of, of you know lessons learned you know from from the victims of attacks i think that's really important because it shows you the reality the consequences of a of an attack on the information system i remember reading um, at the university hospital of rouen at the teaching hospital of rouen they had an automaton device that sterilizes the um, or tools that got blocked because it was um, uh, contaminated by ransomware so they had to get back to you know pen and paper and it was an absolute catastrophe for them and i think it's um it's also important to have people who come and and, and tell their stories uh, share what happened so please do explain uh, and do 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 use previous past attacks in order to raise awareness with people who have not yet fallen victim to hackers yes i think Maybe let's focus for a second on very practical solutions in order to improve the situation. I'm sure we've covered the state of play, I guess. Uh, we know that the situation is complicated and uh, we are playing with a difficult hand, I suppose. But um, how can we... I'd like to maybe hear your opinions regarding what the priorities look like at the moment. What do we need to focus on in order to act in order to, you know, um, determine what's what's missing. I mean, I'm no, I know that we have some very fundamental differences from one facility to the next, but do we have a checklist or anything that can be done and in what order? Yeah, do a backup, a disconnected backup. That is the one thing that I can tell you. Have a backup that's offline, not online. That is the one thing. What's important for facilities is also their lack of ability to restore an information system because backups, you know, had been had been hacked as well. So first thing when you get back home, make sure you have a backup offline, an offline backup, not on the network, not on the internet. I mean, yeah, there are a couple of uh, of go to solutions as far as I'm concerned. Um, first of all, there's a question of posture. Just assume that it's going to happen to you at some point. Do not believe that it only happens to others. And keep in mind that you have to be aware, you have to be able to restore the system as quickly as possible. You were talking about offline backups. There are other solutions as well. And I think we tend to forget quite often that security for users can be a big constraint. It's a, it's a pain. It's annoying. And they will find a way to bypass your security mechanisms. Our approach at Dr. Lieb is that, you know, the number one KPI for us in terms of all of our products productions is user satisfaction. We have a net promoter score for all of our applications. We have panels, consumer panels, patients panels, panels with physicians with whom we work constantly. If you forget what's happening on the ground, you will offer solutions that are probably very secure from a technical perspective, but they will not be um, they will be completely disruptive for the physician's daily work. And I think this is really what was said by my colleague as well. Why don't we use a card to log into systems in the in the hospital world? I was talking recently with a surgeon and he said in the OR they need to um, enter what they did. They spent hours in the room. They have their gloves on. They want something that's easy, streamlined. They don't want something complicated in order to guarantee traceability. And they also don't want for security to be an issue, to be an obstacle. So we need to keep that in mind at every step. There, there's an acronym that I like in the development world, and that's KISS. So keep it simple, stupid, you know, and if you do that, you, you, you win, you, you win the war for sure. Yeah, in terms, you know, the, the job of CISO is th there's one key thing. If you want safety, if, if you want to be safe, will tell you to leave your, your, your mobile phone, your computer out of the room. But this does not correspond to your to the needs of your work. And so we'll say the same to a physician. If you wanted to be perfectly safe from hackers, you'd need to no longer use computers. But it's not possible. So we have to make sure that the information system where your projects are installed corresponds to your needs and then we need to set up solutions. We've talked about the double factor, which is one solution. Um, 
and and most mostly most important is we'll we'll be with you every step of the way. You need to explain why we need to work on security, why passwords, why be careful with emails, and so on and so forth. So at the beginning it'll be about raising awareness, and then we move on to technical solutions. What are we going to set up? Um, how are we going to find a solution in terms of risks? The you know ideally, I mean the the, the most important thing is transparency. Yes, I think it's important not to trust service providers or editors to to you know to insist on on what Cédric Voisin was saying before. You know, I and I and I say that uh, I mean it's a bit provocative, of course, but um, it is uh, it is what it is. Uh, it's true. You need to be wary of that when you start a project talking about telemedicine, e-health, so often new projects for for hospitals, and for that you we work with service providers often. Um, we host those systems um, in, you know, SAS or um, on other platforms in the cloud. We need to set up rules and trusting an editor, selling, you know, telling them, do you have security measures? They say, yeah, yeah, sure. Do you have any, any, any measures in place? Yeah, yeah, sure. Don't worry about it. So you sign and then you arrive um, you, on the day of implementation. They're like, actually, we don't do that. Uh, there's an extra cost for this, or um, we use a protocol that we created eight years ago. This is stuff that ha actually happened to me, so do not trust editors. We have constraints. As healthcare facilities, we work with service providers for sure, software providers. We need to have security rules, you know, a checklist that we need to actually check and we need to make sure that we have a certain level of control where we can say, look, this is what was promised. Would would Dr. Lieb accept to a blind test of um, you know whatever whatever system? Yes or no? Yeah, we actually do have that on the booth if you want to if you want to come and check. Uh, yeah, Dr. Lieb is probably a bad example, but for other service providers it can be a big issue. Um, there's a, a hospital that offers teleconsultation with a market solution. I'm not going to give you their names, but there was an incident. Um, you know, with the OVH service in Strasbourg, a facility called Fire, and they had a um, the service were on on the site. So from one day to the le next, they had no ability to do teleconsultation, not because of a hacking or anything, because of a fire. This was unexpected. They looked at the contract, and there was no B solution. There was no alternative solution, no backup. So um, that that again is very important to 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 really monitor your service providers, not to automatically trust what they tell you. Yes, from a press perspective, I remember the the that that data center fire in in Strasbourg beyond um, the fire in and of itself, you know, the fact that this is, it's just an industrial accident, it may happen, but it raises a lot of question marks for sure. Um, but I think it really showed, in a way, showed up, you know, the lack of culture, the lack of, lack of knowledge that you need to have a backup, that you can't have everything in the cloud, or at least not in the same cloud. And I think it really, it really highlighted that, the, the fact that a lot of people knew very little. Yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes the service provider has a developer or several developers. The CNIL has now a handbook for developers because uh, very recently, with the latest uh, problems that we've encountered, we noticed that uh, developers very often move to cloud solutions and those cloud solutions by default are configured as open so that you may connect to those solutions and, and change the features and parameters. and. Um, you know, it's it's the same as as um, locking your bike when you leave it somewhere in the city. You have to you have to activate encryption if available. You have to you have to have the right reflexes, and that needs to go all the way down to developers because very often they are the ones making technical choices, sometimes by default. So it's very important to raise awareness, and I think. I mean, you do need to challenge the service providers. I agree with you 100% and say, like, did you do a code audit? Did you ask developers whether they respected best practices in terms of encryption, passwords, and so on and so forth? You do need to have everything trickle down all the way down to the people who have, you know, um, who are working on the ground. We spoke in the discussion several times about the conception by design and cybersecurity by design. This is something that we've been talking about for years now. Um, And 
I'd like to come back to what Cédric was saying at the beginning. There are some, some stakeholders that started basically from scratch and that invented their services. So why not, you know, um, talk about security by design in this situation? But there are some stakeholders that are that have a legacy, that have an existing IS, like hospitals or or other similar similar types of of, of, um, of facilities. So can you do cybersecurity by design in such a context, and how? Well, for my teaching hospital, we do have a. We have a huge technical debt. We're using technology that is quite old and we do have, you know, the migration to new techs is not always included in the cost. And we have cost structures that are very strict. So you can't, we can't be flexible. And it's not always, we don't always know what's going to happen. So security by design is possible for new projects, certainly. This is now a part of what we do. It's implemented. Uh, it's part of the demands of the ministry as well to have that uh, be a consideration each and every time. But for all the projects, we also try to calculate the risk, measure the risk and control the risk. It's not by design, of course, because we are, I mean, there are a lot of things that are, um, I mean, sometimes we have to work very hard on architecture questions, but uh, it also needs to change the use. We, we also need to change the use. Sometimes people are used to having a, a four-digit PIN number rather than an ident identification code. So things can change and we need to take that into account. It's not easy. It, it's, 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 not, it's not simple, but we're working on it. And at the moment is where it's taking most, most of our time. Regarding the techniques, I mean, we spoke with, um, I spoke with CISOs often of, um, of healthcare facilities. We noticed that there is a real issue with big editors who developed solutions with over 10 or, or 10 years or, or several decades even, and they no longer have the source code of the, of the core. They don't really have the possibility to change the core of the system. And those were issues uh, with GDPR, for example, where we requested that um, access should be traceable. And, and the editors very often said, we'd like to do that, but we don't know how to do that anymore because we don't have control of the basic system anymore. So then you need to look for, for, for solutions at financial level as well. I know that there's a, um, there's a plan where, you know, some software will have to satisfy some, some cybersecurity criteria, even at territorial level, maybe we can try to work together to purchase solutions together, um, put pressure on the editors so that privacy and security by design is integrated in their solution. I, I think those systems really need to, to evolve. Yes, and I think there are solutions that are um, made compulsory by the CNIL and, uh, you know, for example, where is data housed when they are externalized and also uh, auditing rights that Jean Sylvain has uh, spoken about. When, when you have a right, you need to do it. You can audit it several, in several ways, but, and I think that will help reinforce the confidence, the trust uh, for the editor. There's one line that's missing from, con from contracts, I think. We should make it necessary for the editor to cover the life cycle of the um, support assets that they're using to make sure the app works. We have an app that's working with Windows, let's say, let's say this application or Windows gets updated, the application needs to remain compatible. If they use a database, that database needs to be, so again, you have to, if it's Deviant, you have to be able to, to, to monitor the life cycle of the application, which will help us avoid obsolescence within five to 10 years. We have to have that in editor contracts. Another thing, Regarding privacy, privacy by design, it's true that at the moment it is highly necessary from the get-go to have CISOs involved from the get-go because, again, they are here to help you, they are here to support you, they are here to make sure that the project is fruitful and every euro you don't spend at the beginning of the project is going to mean five or ten euros extra to reach the same level of security with all the constraints and meetings and feeling that the size is keeping you from making progress even though they are here to help you make progress. So from the get-go, do think about safety, do get the teams involved, architects, uh, architects editors, 
um, CISOs, and together they can define a strategy for your projects to to work properly and to be successful. Also know that you'll need an audit budget um, and, and, and it's important to be clear on that from the, from the very beginning. And then you know that uh, some funds might become necessary. Um, we know that some funds will become available as well um, with regional healthcare agencies, for example. But you have to know that you, you need to have a budget for security. You need to have a budget for size. So you need to have a budget for people who are going to work on firewalls, um, access rights, and so on and so forth. Five to 10% of the budget is not it's not too much for the cyber team in a healthcare facility. It's even actually recommended. So do not forget that budget. It is highly important to make your IT system and your IS more perennial, more long lasting. Yeah, we're not going to cover absolutely everything. I think we only have um, an hour together. We have 10 minutes remaining. Um, are there some questions for our speakers? Any questions in the room? Uh, if, if so, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and we can bring a microphone over to you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Rémi Tihi. I'm CISO. Um, in a in a hospital in uh, in the Paris region, we're talking about the uh, security in contracts and markets that we have. I think this is all very nice and good, but regarding control and respect of those security um, dispositions in the case of OVH with the data center that burns, um, you know, with the backups being in the data center, how can we control? Uh, you know, how can we make sure that the, the backups are in two different data centers? How can we, I mean, sometimes in the contract we have the right disposition. Sometimes the, the editor makes a commitment to have two backups in two different data centers. But how can we know that they do what they promise? Well, I have, um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite lucky, I suppose. I work with several hospital groups in Brittany, in the west of France, and some of them have a policy per which you do audits with many um, quality managers and CISOs regarding the software that are used. So every other year, we invite the team and we ask them, so where is everything stored? So we have a look at the contract and we say, where is it? Where are our backups at the moment? Can you show, it, show us what the developers are doing from, from a security perspective? And we do that on, on site in the facilities in order to make sure that everything is going well. We have more than 70 uh, job applications in a teaching hospital, for example, but so we can't do that for everything, but for critical applications, I think having such a such an audit every other year, it doesn't take that long and it's, it is a huge benefit. So this is what I'm going to start setting up for the main editors and we're going to start working on this recurring um, cycle, maybe every other year, maybe every three years, in order to make sure that whatever has been drafted in the contract is also respected properly. And this is what's happening in a lot of facilities, actually. We're not the only ones. Yeah, um, in some cases, also just read the contract. I'd say um, have security engineers read the dispositions and sometimes the dispositions are unclear or not quite precise enough in terms of where the, the, the backup is. So there is work upstream and downstream in order to check the quality of the technical uh, dispositions of contracts. You can't just have a generic disposition offered by the editor or the service provider. There's then another, you know, GDPR has an audit clause. So this is getting organized as well, but there are some editors that have a lot of customers, a lot of clients. They don't want to have them all come over because the data data center, you know, is kind of a closed door facility. It's not like everybody's welcome. So um, so sometimes they have a, an ISO certification or external audits. And this is also something that you can demand. You can ask for the host um, facility to, um, so you can ask ISO 27001. Um, and, and and try to try to make sure that your service provider has a certain level of maturity in terms of governance, security, and so on and so forth. That is that is acceptable. They will be audited by external auditors, and they will be what well, they will have to provide you with a with a certificate. It's a good thing also because you don't have to do the audit yourself. We are all aware that not everybody has the ability to go audit each and every service provider. So you can ask for yeah again ISO certification. I think is a good idea. 
I'd like to ask also maybe two small solutions, often not so expensive, would be to have another server um, with another host, uh, another hoster. Um, and again, have an offline backup, something that is not on the network, that you unplug from the um, IS system of your host. But again, I mean, I, I think it's really very important to, to, to have something offline. You have some solutions that are packaged. You can have sometimes some telemedicine editors that are um, that see their systems, you know, impacted. And you can't have an offline an offline backup in every every situation. Well, yeah, when you're not part of cyber security from the get go, we, we just spoke of an editor. Maybe they don't even exist anymore. But we're talking about another case of a company recently that. Um, was working with um, healthcare data without having the right level of security. I mean, in, in terms of image, um, it's terrible for, for them when, when something goes wrong. Even beyond that, of course, there's legal impacts. So I think in order to, um, I mean, there's a huge penalty for in innovative startups when they don't have the security features they need and 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 there's a huge penalty if, if something goes wrong so it's very important to work on risk analysis risk management so that we have the right action plan so that we can continue with our activity yeah just briefly that can also be integrated in the call for tender if you work directly or with um big you know purchases or if you work together with other hospitals do have the do have that integrated in the call for tenders and then once you get um, offers you'll have offers from editors who are going to tell you look this is what's happening in terms of security i do better i have an added value and that'll help you um do things well from the get-go yeah but we were talking about trust before and i don't really trust editors when they answer a call for tender and um, i take it with a grain of salt certainly mm -hmm. yeah and i guess it gives you also leverage for the rest the call for tender if they make a promise at least you have leverage for i mean in case of i don't want to call it pre-litigation or but but it gives you a certain level of protection and then if the service provider does not provide, then that's, uh, that, that, that can happen. But you've done everything you could in terms of responsibility. You, 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 you did ask for a certain level from your, from your service provider. Your, your job as a, as a manager is also to, to challenge things, um, to ask questions, to ask for external audits maybe. But it is true that it's, a, it's an important dynamic that you need to, that you need to, to focus on and sometimes you know you're working with packaged offers in the cloud or you have a subscription and it's very important to 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 also change that culture yeah the cloud is easy and apparently it works every time there's nothing to be done there's nothing to do no work for me this does not exist there's always work that you need to do maybe one last question if someone is interested maybe we can try for two questions yes hi I'm um, the CISO for the for the blood bank in France, and um, I, I agree with what Jean Sylvain de Chavannes said. And, and I mean, the first thing is go see the legal department. And this is really the, the 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 one piece of advice that I can give you. Go see the legal department. Check the security dispositions. They don't know anything about that. You need to add a lot of dispositions. First thing, then go see people. Tell them. Look, do you have, go see the purchasing department, ask them what they have in terms of, um, ask them for their security demands and check, you know, in terms of, um, I mean, there is, there are security demands, but you need to check, you need to verify. And with purchases, you need to ask purchases to ask the service providers in the device, um, manufacturers and so on and so forth like very often everything is in the cloud so you need to check disposition by disposition you need to have a look at all the elements and ask all service providers all providers in general to come over and explain what they have in place so you need to have you know silos and then from a safety perspective from a security perspective you can ask a provider to um, to provide you with an answer and to also provide you with evidence that they are indeed compliant. 
So not just, yes, I am compliant, but here is why and how, and here is proof. Then another thing that's important um, is you need to have, you need to do an audit once in a while. And from then on, you need to have a test plan. You need to be able to see, you know, what the gaps are in order to have a monthly dashboard with your service provider. And you need to have a, a plan for, 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 um, for assurance, for quality uh, assurance, and you need to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the, everything is integrated. So it's a lot of work, but I think it's really important. This is key even, I'd say. Thank you. I'm Lionel Prad, and I'd like to get back to that notion of audit. Um, in every facility, we have between 150 and 200 apps, applications, work with dif different editors, hosters, and we all we are all talking about single audits. I did quite a bit, quite a few of those in a previous life. I do wonder why we can't manage to have an efficient, technically operational solution for us to have an audit that is done once and for all by the providers. We don't have that many um, providers in the health sector. Very often those are providers that we work with regularly. So I have a question regarding what's the plan? Like, what are we going to do? Um, can we not audit those critical service providers together? Could we not, like, I mean, when you have a look at the OSE and um, would, would that not be a solution to just pull our audit resources, so to speak? Like, could we not? Uh, the, the needs are always the same, so why don't we manage to do things together? I think it's an interesting point. Some of the answer is regulatory, but if you worked in auditing, you know that certification is not always, you know, one of the big issues is the scope of said certification. And I think it's kind of cat and mouse type of game. When you, when you use a very well-known certification, not a lot of people look at the scope. They say, look, this provider is ISO whatever, and they naively, I'd say, um, believe that then it's safe. But very often the solution is much broader than the scope of that certification. So certifications are good, it's a good way to be reassured, but the regulation, at least in the field of health, you know, HDS and other things that will uh, become important later down the line, all of that um, will become even more important. And then there's that point that remains, like in Europe, we are still missing this culture. In the UK, they use scoring entities, so they have a cyber score that is associated to that. So you have a third party structure that uh, creates this cyber score. You can get a subscription and then you're able to prove a certain level of maturity. But it's not it's not very present in Europe yet. But you have to remember also that trust doesn't mean lack of control. You you will still have to audit, maybe less often. And uh, of course, you you'll base that on the on the on the on the criticality of your systems. You so you still need to audit them at some point, maybe less frequently, but still. Just to add upon and to pick up on this, well, why not try this? There's just one concept, one uh, idea that is changing, i.e. using and changing, uh, using AIT systems might lead to a change. You've got a clinical case. We used to have a software, but no uh, name and a audit this doesn't accept that and the safety, security and quality audit, well, the professionals used some uh, data with names in it. So the use has changed and the criteria of the audit changed as well. Hence, the action plan that had to be implemented complying to the GRPD on that question. But without the recurring ed, uh, audit, we'd, we wouldn't have been aware of that. This is something to be taken into account in that field.
very last question. I somehow uh, wondering, and it's no offense to Dr. Dr. Lee, it's a solution very adapted to the pandemic, and it has been a, of a great advantage for sure. But what's the real power, what's the real influence of the CNIL when Dr. Leap transmitted via third parties Facebook uh, data and is hosting also the data of French citizens in Amazon? And we know that an American company is uh, not compatible, not compliant with the GRPD because the uh, Americans and the uh, American authorities did allow the uh, hosters to transfer uh, health data. So what is a guarantee? Do we trust? Can we trust? The, don't you think it might happen tomorrow in France? Well, this is a political question, and I'm not sure I will able to answer this question in two minutes, but we can uh, talk face to face. GRPD doesn't prohibit to uh, use to call upon American uh, service providers. The WS, as you talked about, is compliant with demands determined by the states in terms of protection for uh, health data hosters, and they are certified. Dr. Lip is also certified in number five, which is administration and use of uh, platforms hosting uh, health data. And today, Amazon is blocking some data for us and it might provide a managed service and it's only what they do. The crisis of cookies in Germany, well, we were accused to send data to Facebook and it's not exactly true because that's a kind of journalist uh, issue. It is metadata and if someone with a bad intention at Facebook or elsewhere was going to make a correlation, it could have led to a, a data a leakage. That's not exactly the same. So we had the right also to be accused of different things. We closed Encompass. It's a tool we used for marketing ends to promote some practitioners and we did uh, stop with this. So we want to be positive, of course, constructive. We don't think we have reached the end in terms of security and we still do invest upon that. And we have our apps being, uh, being uh, tested and the best proof is the work we do in terms of ciphering, crypting, and whatever player you call upon will not be able to get access to the data, ourselves included, hence operational issues, but it is our choice because that's a kind of reinsurance which is very strong to GDPs and patients. Again, no perfect answer, but the best answer is that there is a massive investment in security. I've got a major big team and a high capacity and that's what we're talking about with uh, the CNIL. We're talking, walking with uh, Lancy ever since the start of the vaccination campaign. We have been audited by the um, uh, health department. So uh, we are just humans and it might happen to us as well to commit a mistake. But we are trying to uh, work to the best uh, health data health solution. So we went beyond the, the time. And that's maybe the last question of that lady over there. My name is Lukna Elumi, and I'm in charge of R&D at uh, a company Energy. We've got a eye health uh, project. We wanted to have a platform for the uh, elderly uh, home services. And we wanted to do to host something outside. Residents remain at home, don't move to the uh, institutions, and will be monitored by the uh, healthcare providers. We will start from scratch. And my question: It is, I wanted to abide by the rule of respect of uh, patient data. How can I get the uh, certification of the CNIL? Is there anyone uh, taking care of that? So that is really my first, very first priority, to have the uh, patient data through connected uh, tools 
and that will be into the room of that patient. I wanted to abide by the confidentiality about the secrecy. How can I proceed to do that? Thank you for that. Well, on the site of the CNIL there is a method and privacy impact assessment, privacy impact assessment, PIA, PIA, it's the risk analysis extended to cyber security and protection of privacy data. And there is a software that is for free in order for you to proceed to the uh, risk analysis. Even if your system is not totally implemented, you will know as from the start what risk you need to cover. That analysis can be updated a long time and the uh, adding of specifications. Hence, you get all the necessary keys and uh, a method BIOS, which is also compatible with PIA. So you can do both at the same time. CNIL doesn't provide any certificate, but if you were to have specific questions about the management of GRPD, you can ad uh, address a question via mail and we will answer. We are only a few people, but we are trying to answer the best way possible to the companies. Thank you for that. Well, I think we need to close this uh, lecture as we went beyond. Thank you for all.